morning, everybody. How you doing? How you feel? Hey, man, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to bring God's word. Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to share what God has laid on my heart uh, with this group of people. And I will tell you, I completely uh, echo Pastor's thoughts and his comments about this congregation. We have a, a wonderful bunch of people, and you all should give yourselves a round of applause. So thankful to go to church with fine people like yourselves. Amen. Amen. Before we get started, I wanted to pray for Eric O'Sullivan. Eric, will you come up, brother? He's been in and out uh, visiting with doctors, and, and, and I don't mean to throw your business out there. And uh, Eric is a fine young man. He loves the Lord, not only with his words, but also with his actions. And I just wanted to take some time as a church to pray over him and to ask the Lord to, to heal him and to touch his body. Can we do that together? Amen. If I can get some of the men to come up, some of the women as well, let's just lay hands on them. We love you, brother. We thank God for you. You hear me? In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Eric, Lord God. I thank you for his faithfulness. Lord God, I just thank you for his life and how he lives his life for you. Father, we just ask you to touch him. Lord God, even if doctors don't know what to do, I thank you that Dr. Jesus knows exactly what to do. And Father God, we lift him up right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask you to touch his body. We ask, you, we ask you to touch his mind. We ask you to touch his heart. And Lord God, we ask you to touch his health. And Father God, we declare and we speak healing over Eric. Lord God, we speak your favor and your blessings over him. And Lord God, I just thank you that greater is he that is in Eric than he that is in the world. Father God, we thank you for just completely healing him. And Lord God, we thank you and we declare that it's done. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And all of the saints of God say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, brother. Love you. Love you. Amen. So thankful for Eric and what he means to this church, what he means to the youth group, and believe in God that he is going to do great things in Eric's life. Amen. Hey Amen. Before I get started with my sermon, I want to read a verse, and then I'll go into the title of the lesson. But I felt like the Lord impressed upon my heart that as a church, there are some things we need to let go, some things we need to let go of collectively as well as individually. And sometimes it's not as easy to let go of things. The Word of God tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1, listen to what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let me read it one more time. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. God has wanted us to get rid of some stuff. He's wanted us to relinquish some things that some of us we've held on to for years. And not only have we held on to those things, but those things, they've actually held us back from God's goodness, from his favor, from his promises. And today I want to talk about letting go of the insignificant. Letting go of the insignificant. Now, when I say the word insignificant, sometimes it means small or something that's meaningless. That's not how I define this word uh, as I go through to teach this lesson. When I say insignificant, I'm talking about anything that will keep you from doing what God has called you to do or anything that will keep you from God's best. Amen? So letting go of the insignificant. I'm going back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He talks about being surrounded by the saints before us, the great clouds of witnesses or cloud of witnesses. Then he goes on to say, let us throw off everything that hinders. The word of God declares and it tells us that as believers, we need to learn how to throw things off of us. We need to learn how to relinquish things. We need to learn how to let go of things. And those things are not just material possessions, but those things could be relationships. Those things could be words that were spoken over you many years ago that you've held on to and you haven't let them go. 
then he goes on to say, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. I want to say this. We all have things we carry that God is either uh, asking us to let go of. He's asking us to relinquish. We all have things uh, that sometimes they weigh upon us. But as believers, it is important that we learn to let go of those things. Uh, I want to go to Jeremiah. I want to talk a little bit about Jeremiah. I think uh, Jeremiah is an excellent example of letting go of the insignificant. We've all heard the story of Jeremiah when he was called to the ministry. We know that he was called at a very young age. I kind of saw some things uh, as I was reading this that the Lord showed to me that I want to share with this group. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. We know what God said. He says uh, to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Say promise. 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 God set him apart. God set him aside. God called him and God had a work for him to do. Look at verse 6. So God gave Jeremiah a promise. Look at verse 6. This is Jeremiah's rebuttal. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for I am too young. Wait. I want you to hear what I'm saying. He says, Lord, I can't speak because I'm too young. That's a wait. I'll come back to this, but I want to take you to Genesis. I'm not going to go there. When God promised Abram or Abraham at that time and Sarah that he would give them a kid, what did they say? Too old. Wait. You see, we have one who says, Lord, I'm too young. I can't do what you called me to do because of my age. I don't know if it was a a, a cultural factor that played into this. I don't know if Jeremiah felt insignificant. I don't know what it was, but there was a weight that was placed upon him. And that weight was there to stop him from fulfilling what God had called him to do. You see, we all have weight. Sometimes uh, we put those weights on ourselves. Sometimes those weights are spoken over us at a young age. Sometimes those weights are spoken over us uh, at our current age, but God commands us to throw aside the weight. He commands us to throw aside anything that would hinder our ability to hear from him or our ability to walk in his ways. I'm too young. What is your weight? Is your weight you don't make enough money? Is your weight how you were raised and the family you were raised in? What is your weight? What are the things that the enemy has placed on you to prohibit you from moving forward in the things of God? Look at what God tells Jeremiah in verse 7 and 8. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. So God instructed him, number one, of how to talk. See, sometimes we have to not only change our vocabulary, but we have to allow God to teach us what to say and what not to say. You see, the word of God says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it wasn't just words coming out of his mouth, but he believed that. That was something inside of him that told him, that he was not able and he was not capable of following God's command because of his his age. God says, don't say I am too young for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people for I will be with you and I will protect you. So God not only taught Jeremiah how how to speak, right? He told him it's important that you obey me. It's important that you listen to me. Listen, it wasn't to make Jeremiah a better person, but God knew Israel, they were in bondage and they needed deliverance. You see, it's important that we relinquish the weights so that God can send us forth and so that people can hear the message of the gospel and so that they can receive deliverance. I never saw this and I don't know why. Jeremiah, he obeyed. Like, I don't know how. Scripture does not, uh, it, it does not give us specifics around what happened to change his heart and to change his mind about the weight of his age. But Jeremiah, he listens, 
he obeys, he preaches the word, and God brings deliverance in the future to the Israelites. Unfortunately, they did not heed the message of Jeremiah. Let me share this with you. I remember, uh, and, and I probably shared this before, but I remember when I, I had an opportunity to apply for a job in Atlanta to become a supervisor. Now, I didn't want to do that job. I think I have mentioned this. I worked in a union environment, not that it was bad, but the people treated leadership like dirt. Like they would literally use profanity towards their supervisors and their managers to tell them what they would do and what they would not do. And I, I wouldn't behave that way, right? I would always treat the people in authority with respect. But a supervisor came to me and said, Marcus, we have a new opening. I mentioned your, your name uh, for a supervisor role. I think you would do an outstanding job. And I just thought to myself, man, I don't know if I gave you my permission to mention my name. I don't want to be in that predicament where people are going to talk all kind of ways about me. They're not going to listen. Like, I was a hard worker. I did a good job. I would get in that job, and I would give them 120%, 130%. When the people got upset with leadership, and they would slow down. They literally would slow down. And one time they said, Marcus, they're not treating us right. We're going to slow down. I told them there's no way I would do that. That's stealing. How can I tell you about Jesus if I can't do this simple task that this company has given me? Right? So my witness wasn't just a good word. My witness was a rebuttal when it wasn't popular with that particular group. Amen? So I just thought there's no way I want to do this job. There's no way I would ever do this job. And as I prayed, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And he oppressed it upon my heart. Hey, I want you to interview for that job. And I thought, man, Jeff Barker, you started all of this. You should have never mentioned my name. And I had an agenda, so I didn't want to do it. I want to be honest with you. I didn't want to do it because I knew the hardship that I would endure with that particular job. Long story short, I said I was going to talk to two people. One was my father-in-law, love him, respect him. And one was a guy on a job, right? And the way I worded the opportunity, I said, Dad, let me talk to you. They want me to interview for this job. They treat people bad. They curse out supervisors. They're insubordinate. What do you think? I think you should go for it. I think you can do a good job. I'm like, dude, you haven't even been listening to me. Like, are you kidding me? I said, yeah, I can't listen to Dad. He lives in Chicago. He doesn't even know what's going on in Atlanta, right? Then I talked to a minister, Curtis Robinson. He worked on the floor. He was a minister. I said, minister, you know what's going on here. They want me to go for this job. You know how they treat supervisors. They curse them out. They're insubordinate. They won't listen. He said, I think it's time to get some godly leadership up here. I said, you haven't even been watching. Dad is not listening, and you're not watching. I interviewed for the job. I got the job. Reluctantly, I accepted the job. Now, I was obedient in that vein, but oh, man, I struggled on that job. I didn't like that job. I would come home, and I would complain to my wife about that job. But I want you to hear why. I was afraid of what the people would say about me. It wasn't the responsibilities. Those people never used profane language towards me. Now, maybe when I walked away, they did, right? But they never used it towards me. I was respectful to them, right? I struggled on that job because I was afraid of what they would say about me. And it took about nine months. And I don't know how my wife did it, but I would complain every single day. But once I allowed the Lord to deliver me from their opinions about me, from what they thought about me, I love my job. I'll tell you, when people didn't do their jobs, I held them accountable and I did it in love. I would write them up and I would say, I love you. I would. I would. One lady, she didn't do her job. I asked her three times. I wrote her up. She didn't speak, she didn't speak to me for about four months. And you know what I did every morning? I would walk over to her. Hey, Sister Glenda, how you doing? She would ignore me. Have a good day, Sister Glenda. Day two, hey, Sister Glenda, how you doing? She would ignore me. God bless you, Sister Glenda. Four months of that. And then one day I went up to her. I said, hey, Sister Glenda, how you doing? I was about to leave. She said, Brother Marcus, I'm blessed. I said, girl, give me a hug. How you doing? I had to get over the fear. Jeremiah was afraid, right? Something as insignificant as his age was holding them back. 
but he was able to make the adjustment. He was able to move forward in the things of God. He was able to experience God's best because he learned to let go of the insignificance. Let me tell you what weight are designed to do. Weights are designed to keep you from fulfilling your purpose. I was terrified of leading those people because I just wanted their respect, right? I, I wanted them to like me as a human being. I was a hard worker. I did my job, but that was a weight. Even if I took that job on or if I didn't take that job on, that was a weight, and I had to allow God to deliver me from that weight. I had an interesting uh, conversation with Brother Tim Thomas, and one time I talked about something, and Tim said, you know what, brother? You talked about what we need to go from, but this is what the Lord shows me, showed me we need to go to. You may or may not remember that, Brother Thomas, but it blessed me. But we need to let go of the insignificant so we can receive God's very best. You see, you can't receive his promise until you let go of the things that are holding you back, the things that are insignificant. You can receive it, but you can't receive it to its fullness. So how do we let go of the insignificant? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So in order to get rid of or to relinquish or let go of the insignificant, we have to learn to focus on Jesus. Right. Listen, weights don't fall off by themselves, right. right? We have to let go of the weight and we have to focus our eyes on Jesus. Now, I want to go back to Jeremiah. I don't know how he got past it, right? And I think a part of the answer of letting go of your weight is predicated upon you and how you are. Sometimes, some people let go of weights through accountability. There are some things I know I am not good at, I can't do, and so the way I let go of it is through my wife. I share it with her. I talk to her. She keeps me accountable. Sometimes, I just don't go around it, right? If I'm, if I'm fasting from TV, I can't be around Matlock. I can't go around the TV because I love that show and I know I will watch that show. We have to focus on Jesus and when we focus on him, I believe he will give us wisdom for how to let go of ways. I'm going to ask Brother Glenn to come up. And, and, and this is how we look, and we don't realize it, right? Come on up, Brother Glenn. All right, you need to strategically lift that chair. There you go, brother. All right, I, I think I'll hold it from here. Just sit close, though. But this is how we walk around. We walk around with weights. This weight could be my bills. This weight could be my relationship. This weight could be my job. But the Bible tells us we need to cast it aside. If it's fear, we need to cast it aside, right? If it's, man, I'm just horrible at relationships, we need to cast it aside. And so we need to learn to take whatever weights are holding us back, whatever weights are hindering us, and we need to learn to cast it aside and give it to Jesus. Jesus has been working out, y'all. Amen? <laughs> Amen. We have to learn to cast the weights aside. Look at Psalm chapter 91, Psalm 91, verse 3. The Word of God says, Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. When it talks about snare, that word means trap. The devil brings weights in our lives, or sometimes we bring weights in our lives, and they become a trap, right? And until we get out of those traps and allow God to do what he wants to do in our life, we're stuck. We're stuck. Like, literally, I'm not joking. Nine months, it took nine months for me to get delivered from what those people thought about me. It could have happened right away. I think about the children of Israel. They were in the desert 430 years because they couldn't receive God's best. 12 mile radius, walking in circles because they couldn't receive God's best. Right? We need to receive God's best. And I will tell you, once I got, man, I can't tell you how free I was once I got past that. But for me, 
it was really allowing God to tell me and show me, hey, I have you. I'm going to take care of you. He told Jeremiah, hey, don't be afraid of the people. I'm going to protect you. And God protected the people. So God wants to deliver you from the weights. He wants to deliver you from the trap, the traps that the enemy has set, um, set in front of you. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, the word of God says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, I do want to say this. Getting rid of weight, sometimes it's instantaneous, sometimes it's not. But the Bible tells us, number one, we focus on Jesus, but number two, we need to consider his example so we can encourage ourselves and not become weary. I remember when I was at ORU, and my wife and I, we were at a church service. Uh, I had to go on a mission trip. I was going to Spain, and I was believing God to give me the, the financials to, uh, to get me there. And when I, when I went to do the mission trip, normally you have about four or five months to register to raise your money. I didn't have that much time. Uh, I only had a, a couple of months. And I remember I needed some shoes, right? I needed some shoes, and my mom said, okay, baby, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, send you some, we'll get some money to you. We'll send you some shoes. And my wife and I, we were in a church service, and, I, you know, I, I just told God, look, man, I, I need some shoes. You know, it's a need. If you don't mind, I, I, I need you to help me out, right? And so while we're in this church service, uh, a guy behind me said, hey, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And Stephanie was there with me. He said, I feel like the Lord spoke to me. Maybe this was Germany, not Spain, Germany. I was going to Germany. He says, uh, what do you have need of? I said, well, man, I, I need some shoes. He said, okay, what about the lady next to you? I said, her dad is a doctor. She don't need anything. She's, <laughs> she's like, why did you tell him my daddy was a doctor? I said, girl, your dad is a doctor. You don't need anything. I said, yeah, my mom ain't a doctor, man. I need some shoes, brother, if you can, if you can help me out. The Lord, speak to you. And uh, he reached over, and he grabbed my hand, and he said, this is from Jesus. He said, this is from Jesus. And he gave me a hundred dollar bill and I was able to go buy me some shoes so I can go to missions. Right. And so even something like that. Right. You know, my mom and I, we were believing God for that money. Uh, and that man didn't know me. Right? He didn't know my mother. He didn't know what I had need of. But he heard from the Lord. And when he heard from the Lord, he was able to meet a need. And I believe God reciprocated that and God blessed him. And, and this is all I'm trying to say. If your need is $100 for shoes, if your need is you need deliverance from fear like I did or like Jeremiah did, whatever your need is, if you will learn to take that weight and cast it off. Pastor Marcus, how do I do that? By focusing on Jesus, right? By focusing on Jesus. I, I can't give you two or three steps. I can't tell you. If you focus on him, he will give you wisdom and he will show you exactly what you need to do. So my second point is cast the insignificant things onto God, whatever they are. Cast the insignificant things onto God. First Peter chapter five, verse seven is one of my favorite uh, passage in the Bible. And I love this because I, I stand on this scripture and it's an excellent uh, word. It says, cast all of your anxiety or all of your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Right? Not because he needs you to do something for him. Not because people need deliverance. Cast them on God because he cares for you. Right? I take those cares, that fear, I put it at the foot of the cross. I put it under the blood of Jesus. So whatever your cares are, whatever that anxiety is, cast it upon yes. him. Amen? Yes. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress or tower. The godly runs to him, and they are safe. No matter what I'm dealing with, no matter where I am, I can run to my heavenly father, and I'm safe. He's big brother. He will take care of me, and he will protect me. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, don't worry about what? Anything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all he's done. Look at verse 7. Then you will experience God's peace. I believe when we take those, 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 those weights and when we take those sins 
and when we cast them off, when we give it to him, I believe we experience Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Now, listen, it didn't say the peace wouldn't come once the weight is gone. It says, look, just thank him. Give it to him. Right? I'm not saying the bill is not gone or is paid, but, but trust God and give it to him. And in the midst of that situation, you can experience his peace, which exceeds our humanly understanding. Right? It says his peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I can't tell you the number of times I've had a situation. I prayed about it. I gave it to God. I was done with it. I had peace. I ordered me some Marco's pizza. I got me some Kit Kats. And I enjoyed myself because I realized my heavenly father is going to take care of this. This is not my issue. This is something God has to do. My last point. Letting go of the insignificant, it opens up doors for the significant. You see, if you can't relinquish that person who hurt you, how are you ever going to find God? If you can't allow God to do something in that relationship that's fragmented, how are you ever going to uh, meet new people? How are you ever going to build uh, meaningful and lasting relationships uh, with the people of God in this house? No, no, Pastor Marcus, you don't understand what they said to me. You don't understand how they treated me. I'm never going to allow that to happen again. I'm closed. And I'm not open to receive God's best. As I close, when I say insignificant, I'm saying anything that would hold you from God's best. Can you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I want you to picture or I want you to imagine what's holding you back. What are the things that are a stumbling block or it trips you up? It keeps you from doing what God has called you to do, it keeps you and keeps your family from being a cohesive unit. What are the weights that you're dealing with? I want you to visualize them. And I want you to think to yourself, what if I could lay these aside? What if I could give this to God? What if I gave God an opportunity to deal with these? What could God do in me? What could God do in my heart. I will tell you, I'm so thankful for God's faithfulness. And I'm in love with Jesus, and I thank him for this life he's given me. Hasn't been perfect. Hasn't been perfect. But I'll tell you, God is faithful. And I believe the Lord gave me this word today because week after week, we walk in this building. Week after week, we love on each other. And we have weights. And pastor gave a word this morning. He was saying how God wants to fulfill the promises that he's given us. And we allow weights. We allow mistakes. We allow things to hold us back. In order for us to move forward in God's best and God's power, God wants us to relinquish the weights. Some of you are a little bit, you know, I'm Pastor Marcus, I don't know about that. Listen, if Pastor Stephanie is married to me, but if she still likes somebody in her past, our relationship can be the very best it is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So she had to let go. We have to let go of the things in the past so God can open up doors of significance. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Right now, I declare weights are falling all around us. Cares are being cast upon you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I speak and I declare your best. I thank you, Lord God, that forgiveness is happening right now. Lord God, sins are falling by the wayside right now. Lord God, people are opening up their hearts to you right now. And I thank you, Lord God, that our best days are in front of us. They're not behind us. I don't care what our ages are. Lord, I thank you that our best days are in front of us. And Lord God, I thank you individually weights are falling. I thank you collectively weights are falling. 
And I just thank you that the blood of Jesus is cleansing our sins right now. And Lord God, we thank you for it. We receive your very best. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.